In the previous section, you saw all of the data types available to you. So you'll have code where you use integers and decimals and strings, etc. And from time to time, you'll want to write code that uses more than one data type in the same line of code. For example, you might want to take an integer value and multiply it by a decimal value. To do that, you're going to need to convert one data type to another. There are two types of conversions, widening and narrowing. In a widening conversion, the new data type is capable of storing all of the values that can be stored in the original data type. So for example, if you convert a 32-bit integer to a decimal, that conversion will always succeed because the decimal can store everything that a 32-bit integer can. And because there's no risk of data loss, the compiler will make the conversion for you automatically. You actually don't have to write code to make a widening conversion happen. The other type of conversion is a narrowing conversion. In the narrowing conversion, the new data type is not capable of storing all of the values that can be stored in the original data type. So for example, if you convert an integer to a byte, there could be data loss. And because of that, the compiler will not automatically make the conversion. You'll need to make the conversion yourself in code. So you don't have to write code to do a widening conversion. You do have to write code to make a narrowing conversion. In general, you should probably make your conversions explicitly anyway, because your code is more readable and understandable. Let's look at three ways that you can convert one data type to another in your code. First, you can use a conversion function. Conversion functions are part of the Visual Basic language, and there's one for each data type. So in this line of code, we have two variables. One's a short, one's a byte, and we want to add them together. So C short and passing in the byte value will convert that byte to a short, and then you can do the math adding the two shorts together. The next option is to use the convert class, which is in the .NET framework. That class provides a conversion method for each data type. So in this code, we want to convert a variable that's a long to a single. So we use convert.toSingle and pass to it the long variable. This code then takes the long and converts it to a single. And the third method is to use the parse method, which will convert a string to a data type. So in this code, we want to take a long value, represented by the variable long value, and convert it to a single. So first, we take the string representation of long value, and then we pass that to the parse method of the single structure. And that says, start with a long, turn it into a string, parse that, and turn it into a single. Now obviously, taking a long, turning it to a string, and then turning it back to a single is not typically what you do in your code. Typically, you would probably use convert to single in the first place. But if your data is coming into you as strings to begin with, then the parse method is the way to go. In the previous section, we talked a little bit about converting from objects to specific data types. And this is an important concept that you really need to understand. There are two types in the .NET framework, value types and reference types. A variable that contains a value type directly stores its values. And those values are stored in the stack, which is a pool of memory allocated by the runtime. And because you're declaring value types in your code, the runtime knows to allocate the proper amount of memory for them. And this is efficient because the space has already been allocated on the stack, which again is a piece of memory. All of the integer data types, floating point, decimal, boolean, these are all value types, and they directly store their values. The other type of variable is a reference type. The reference type does not store the value. It merely stores a reference to where the value is. And these are stored in the heap. And this is a pool of memory whose size is dynamic. If you use a reference type, you're not specifying ahead of time how much memory to reserve for it. So the runtime will allocate memory as needed. The actual value you're storing in a reference type variable is stored in the stack, but the variable itself contains a reference to the value. And that reference is used to find the value each time you reference the variable in code. 
and this is less efficient than using value types. Reference types include strings and objects, as well as classes you create. Strings and objects are reference types, as well as classes. Two terms that you'll see often when talking about value types and reference types are boxing and unboxing. Boxing is when a value type is converted to a reference type. So the framework copies the value to the heap and brings back a reference to the value. So if you store 7 in an object variable, that's boxing. 7 is an integer, that's a value type. You're converting it to a reference type to store it in an object. Later on, you want to read the value of the object, and this is known as unboxing, because the reference type is now converted to a value type. So the framework uses the reference to copy the value back into a value type. So you have 7 stored in an object. The .NET framework has a reference to the 7, goes and retrieves that, and then brings that back. So it's boxing when you store a value type into a reference type. It's unboxing when you retrieve the value of a reference type and put it into a value type. And both of these are less efficient than using value types to begin with. Now there are obviously times when you'll use boxing and unboxing. For example, if you're converting an integer to a string to display it on the screen, you're going to have to convert between a value type and a reference type. So the takeaway is not to never use boxing and unboxing. The takeaway is to understand how value types and reference types work and write the most efficient code that you can. Let's go see a demo of converting from one data type to another. I'm in the sample application. Let's look at some code that does conversions. Here I'm going to create three variables. Units ordered is defined as an integer and set to 100. Unit price is defined as a decimal and is set to 24 and a half. And then total amount is also defined as a decimal. I then want to multiply units ordered, which is an integer, times unit price, which is a decimal. This is a widening conversion, because there won't be any data loss. I can multiply an integer times a decimal and store it in a decimal and not lose data. In this case, 100 times 24.5 is 2,450. There's no data loss. That happens to be an integer, but if the result happened to have fractions, that could also be stored in the decimal, so this code will compile and run fine. Let's look at a narrowing conversion. I'm going to comment this code and uncomment this code here. And the difference is that total amount is now defined to be an integer. Well, if I multiply an integer times a decimal, there could be data loss. Because the integer does not store fractions, and the decimal does. So the compiler will not allow this. I cannot convert a decimal to an integer implicitly. Well, I can do this explicitly, so I can say, take the decimal, convert it to an integer, and then multiply the two integers together and store that in total amount. So if I, on purpose, want to take the risk of losing data, well, the compiler will let me do that, but it won't do it on its own. Okay, let's run this sample and look at some additional ways of converting. Let's look at widening conversions. So I'll press L. And we're going to look at three different ways of doing conversions. First, we'll look at using conversion functions, then the convert class, then the parse method. So let's step into conversion functions and see what happens. I'm going to define a number of variables using various data types, and then pair by pair, add them together, and do some converting. So first we have a byte value, which is 2, and a short value, which is 100. And I want to add the two of them together. So I use the CSHORT function to convert the byte value to a short, and then I can add that to the short value. And the result of adding 102, of course, is 102. Next up, we have the short value, which is a variable of the short data type, an integer value, which is defined as an integer. I want to add the short and the integer, so I use the cint function on short value, convert that to an integer, then I can add that 
to integer value. And the result is the addition here. I can use CLNG to convert to a long, CSNG to convert to a single, CDBL to convert to a double, and CDEC to convert to a decimal. So I'm now going to right click on this line of code here and run to cursor, and that will cause all of the lines of code between the one I'm currently on and the one I just right clicked on to run, and then execution will pause. So here's the integer, which we converted to a long and added to another long. Here's a long value that was converted to a single and added to a single. And notice that after converting the long to single and adding it to this single, the decimal places disappear. So converting an integer to a floating point, because of the way floating points are stored in memory, caused the decimals to disappear in this example. Here I converted a single to a double and I gained a little bit more precision than I was expecting. The single variable has three decimal places, the double has four. Converting the single to the double and adding them together, the result is accurate to three decimal places, but there's more decimal places than I thought. And again, that's due to the way floating point numbers are stored in memory. So you'll need to be careful converting from an integer to a floating point or converting among floating points. And finally, the double converted to the decimal, no conversion issues. Okay, moving on, we have a decimal and a string, and then I'm going to convert the decimal to a string and add them together or concatenate them. And the result of that is taking the string representation of the number and adding it to the string. So this is now one big string. We'll do the same thing with a character. We have A is a character, ABC is a string. Convert the character to a string. Now we have two strings, add them together, and the result is ABCA. We can convert zero to a boolean, or one to a boolean, and zero converted to a boolean is false, one converted to a boolean is true. And then finally, we can use the cdate function to convert a string. Earlier, you saw the use of the pound sign as literals. Pound one slash one slash 2100 pound is a date. You can also use cdate and pass the string representation and that then is converted to a date. Now let's see doing the same types of conversions using the convert class. Let's step into this code. We have the same variables. And now we'll be using methods of the convert class. So to convert the byte to a short, we use convert dot to int 16. To convert to an integer, convert dot to int 32. To int 64 converts to a long. To single and to double convert to single and double. Convert to decimal. And then there is a convert to string method as well. And finally, convert to boolean, convert to date time. So let's run this down to here and then see the results. And we get the same thing we saw before, only this time using the convert class in the .NET framework rather than the conversion functions defined in the Visual Basic language. And now finally, we'll use the parse method to do these conversions. Same variables. The parse works on the string representation of a variable. So we'll take the byte value, convert it to a string, and then call the parse method of the int 16 structure, and that will take the string representation and convert it to a short. And then when we add the two shorts together, once again, 
we have the results we saw before. Each of the data types has a parse method and you pass in the string representation of what it is you want to convert. So single, double, decimal, and to convert the strings, there's no string.parse, so we'll continue to use cstr here. There is a boolean.parse, and there's a datetime.parse. And so the results are once again the same conversions. So you've seen three different ways to do conversions. The conversion functions built into Visual Basic, the convert class, or the parse method of the various data types. And you'll use whichever one makes the most sense for the task at hand. And finally, let's look at value types and reference types. Defining a string called string1 and an instance of the XML writer class, which lives in the system.xml namespace in the .NET framework. And the XML writer is used to write an XML file. So this is a class. And I'm defining writer as an instance of that class and string1 as an instance of the string class. So string1 and writer are reference variables. And if you define these without assigning them a value, then their value is nothing. And you can then ask if string1 is nothing or if writer is nothing. You can do that with reference types. Value types, if you define them without passing in a value, they get a default value. The default value for numeric types is zero. The default value for a boolean is false. Reference types don't have default values. And therefore, you can ask if they are equal to nothing. And in this case, they are. Next, I create two variables, object1, which is an object. That's a reference type. Number1 is an integer. That's a value type. And when I store 77 to number 1, number 1 now contains the value 77. When I set the value of object 1 equal to that value, object 1 does not contain a 77. It contains a reference to the location of memory where that 77 is. Setting object 1 to number 1 is boxing because the .NET runtime takes the value in number 1 stores it in memory, and then stores a reference to that value in object 1. Then, when we display the value of object 1, which is 77, this is unboxing. The runtime looks in object 1, finds the reference to the value, goes into that part of memory, and brings the reference back, and then displays that as a string. And in fact, that's unboxing and boxing because to take that value type and display it as a string requires converting it to a reference type. And now when I convert number one to a string and store it into string one, that's another example of boxing. And then when I display it, again, there's unboxing. Now remember, the key takeaway here is not that you should never box and unbox. It's that you should understand the difference between value types and reference types and understand the implications on performance and memory usage, and then write code that's as efficient as you can. Let's take a look at some additional ways you can store information. And these aren't literally variables, but they serve a similar purpose, and that is as a place to store information. Constants get declared like variables, but they differ in that their value cannot be changed in code. So you can think of them, if you want, as read-only variables. And a perfect candidate for a constant would be, for example, the value of pi. You define it once, it doesn't change, and then you can just use it over and over again in your code by referring to the name of the constant. Enumerations are a collection of related constants. An enumeration has a name, and it stores a numeric data type. Then inside the enumeration, you have a number of fields, each with a name and a value. So for example, you might create an enumeration for the months in the year. There are 12 of them. And so you might have an enumeration called months, 
and then one of the fields is January, one of the fields is February, etc. And those have values. Or you could do days of the week. Structures are user-defined data types. They're similar to enumerations in that they're a collection of values, but they can contain any data type. An enumeration contains numeric values, but a structure can contain anything. So strings, date times, etc. So let's go see a demo of constants, enumerations, and structures. I'm in the sample application, and we'll take a look at using constants, enumerations, and structures. Let me run this and step through the code. I'm going to press N for this example. And the first thing we'll do is look at constants. In this code, I've defined two constants, one called months and year, and one called days and year. I use the const keyword instead of dim. So if I say const months in year as integer equals 12, and then const days in year as integer equals 365, I declare these constants as integers and assign them values. And now in my code, I can just use the constant, and months and year will be equal to 12, and days and year will be equal to 365. And in this example, I display those values. OK, now let's look at enumerations. To declare an enumeration, I use the enum keyword. So in this example, I have two enumerations, one for calendar week, one for work week. And they're defined as storing integers. You can see that they both have the same fields, Sunday through Saturday, but the numbers are different. Because in the calendar week, Sunday is the first day, but in the work week, Monday is the first day, and Sunday is the last day. So let's step into the code. And now in this code, when I want to reference Sunday in the calendar week, I can say calendar week dot Sunday, and it will show me the value. I can use IntelliSense for that. So if I type calendar week dot, there's a list of the fields in the calendar week enumeration. And I can actually see the values if I need to remember them. And I can do the same thing for work week. So in this code, I display that Sunday is day whatever the value of calendar week dot Sunday is, and then display Sunday is day whatever the value of workweek.sunday is. And that shows me that Sunday is day one in the calendar week and day seven in the work week. So with the enumeration, I gather up all of the fields. And then all I have to do is remember the name of the field I want to work with. I don't actually have to remember its value. OK, and then finally, we'll look at structures. To declare a structure, I use the structure keyword. So this structure called author has four fields in it, first name, last name, company, and title. And then I create a variable called author1, and I specify the data type being that structure. And then I can then assign values to the fields. And in the IntelliSense, I get company, first name, last name, title. They appear. So in this code, I'll assign a name, title, and company to the first author, create a second variable called author2, which is also of type author, assign a name, title, and company to that author. And now I can see that author1 has a last name of Getz and a first name of Ken. Author2 has a last name of Green and a first name of Robert. And I can display that information along with the title and company in my code. So constants are a way of storing values that don't change. Enumerations are a group of related constants that have a value of integer. And structures are like enumerations, but they can store any value. And in the example you saw here, we used a string. The role of operators is to perform an action on one or more values and then return the results. There are a number of operators. Arithmetic 
to perform addition and subtraction, string operators to change the value of a string, assignment operators are used to assign a value to a variable, comparison operators give you the ability to compare the value of two or more variables, logical operators allow you to group expressions, and then type operators give you the ability to determine if a variable is of a certain type. Let's look at these in more detail. The arithmetic operators perform basic arithmetic on variables. So plus is used to add two numbers. It can also be used to convert a negative number into a positive number. Minus subtracts two numbers, or you can use it to convert a positive into a negative. The star is used to multiply two numbers, and the forward slash is for division. The mod operator divides two numbers and then returns only the remainder that results. The backslash divides two numbers and returns only the integer part, discarding the fractions. And the caret, which is shift six, raises a number to the power of another number. The ampersand and plus string operators are used to concatenate two strings together. And this produces a new string. Visual Basic also has the like operator, and you can use that to determine if a string matches a pattern. And it supports various wildcards. You can use a star to match zero or more characters. You can use a question mark to match any single character. You can use the pound sign to match any digit, and you can use the brackets to match a list of characters. Assignment operators perform the same operations as the arithmetic operators, just with a little less code. So plus equal adds two numbers, or again converts a negative number to a positive number. So instead of saying variable one equals variable one plus two, you could say variable one plus equals two. So it's less typing. It does the same thing, but it saves you code. Minus equal subtracts two numbers or converts positive to negative. Star equal multiplies. Forward slash equal divides. Backslash equal divides two numbers and returns only the integer. And then caret equal raises a number to the power of another number. Comparison operators are used to compare two values. The equal sign will return true if two values you're comparing are equal. Use less than, greater than to return true if the two values are not equal. Greater than will return true if the first value is greater than the second. Less than returns true if the first value is less than the second. Then there's greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. Logical operators are used to compare two expressions. So if you say A and B, that will return true if the expression represented by A is true and the expression represented by B is also true. So if both are true, and will return true. A or B returns true if either A or B is true. Not A returns true if A is not true. A, X or B returns true if either one of them is true, but not both of them. A and also B returns true if both A and B are true. And if A is not true, then B does not get evaluated. This is called short circuiting. And if A is not true, then there's no reason to test B, because if A is not true, then A and also B cannot be true. A or else B is the short circuiting version of the or. This returns true if either A or B is true. And if A is true, there's no reason to evaluate B, and the expression returns true. A is B returns true if A and B refer to the same object, and A is not B returns true if they do not. Type operators can be used to test whether an object is of a particular data type. So in this code here, object one is an object. It's assigned the value of seven, and then we can have code that says if type of object is integer, then do something. So type of is the type operator here.
Let's go see a demo of these various operators and see them in code. I've got the sample app up and running. Let's take a look at arithmetic, string, comparison, logical, and type operators, and then take a quick look at operator precedence. Let's look at arithmetic operators first. I'm going to declare a variable, total amount, as a double, and it equals 100. And then also declare a variable called result, which is going to hold the result of doing some arithmetic. This is a fairly simple example. We'll add 100 to the total amount, subtract, multiply, and divide. Let's look at those first. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And go check the results. And they are the numbers we'd expect. So fairly straightforward to do arithmetic. We can also use the backslash to do division and return just the integer amount. So before I do that, I'm going to convert the double to an integer using the CLNG function, and then do a division and look at the result, and 17 divides into 100 five times. There is a remainder, and we can use the mod operator to determine that. So we divide 17 into 100, and the leftover, after it goes in five times, is 15. We can do the same thing with decimals. Let's divide 17 and a half into 100 and find out what's left over, and that would be 12 and a half. And then finally, we can raise 100 to the power of 2, and that gives us 10,000. We'll continue running, and let's look at string operators. String operators are going to give us the ability to concatenate strings and then also search for patterns. So let's do concatenation first. We've got two string variables, author1 and author2, and then I'm going to create a third string variable called greeting. I'm going to take the contents of author1, which is Ken, add and to it, add the contents of author2, which is Robert, and then add say hello. And I'm going to build my greeting, Ken and Robert say hello. The like operator gives me the ability to match strings to a pattern. So the like operator gives us the ability to ask questions. Does a string match a pattern? So first we can ask, does the string Ken begin with a K? And the pattern is Ken is like capital K followed by any number of characters? And the answer to that is yes. Does Ken have a lowercase k in it? So is Ken like any number of characters, lowercase k, any number of characters? The answer to that is false. Does the string Ken match the following pattern? any number of characters, capital K, followed by any number of characters? And the answer to that is yes. The string Ken has a capital K in it. So this says any number of characters, including no characters, capital K, any number of characters. Does the string Ken match the following pattern? A capital K, any single character, and a lowercase n, run that, and the answer is yes. Kin matches the same pattern, capital K, a letter, and a lowercase n. The string Kent does not. As you can see, Kent has a capital K, it has a single letter, it has an n, but then the T causes the match to fail. The string Ken will not match the next pattern, capital K, any letter, a lowercase n, any single letter. However, Kent should, so this should return true. Does the string capital K, capital G1 match the following pattern? Capital K, any single letter, any single digit, and the result should be true. Does the string Ken match the following pattern? Capital K, a lowercase vowel, 
and then any single letter from lowercase a to lowercase z. The answer there is true. And finally, does the string Kent match the pattern of capital K, any lowercase letter followed by another lowercase letter? And the answer is false. Next, we'll look at comparison operators. We'll create two integer variables, number one, which is 100, and number two, which is 200. Then I'm going to do a number of comparisons on them. Number one equals number two is an expression that will evaluate to true or false based on whether or not the numbers are equal. In fact, this evaluates to false because, of course, 100 is not equal to 200. And then I'm going to display the results of that along with the other comparisons. We'll look at inequality. Are the two numbers not equal? Is number 1 plus 200 greater than number 2? Is number 1 less than number 2 minus 100? Is number 1 greater than or equal to number 2? Is number 1 less than or equal to number 2? Let's see the results for those. And here are the results of doing these relatively simple comparisons. So again, number 1 is equal to 100. Number 2 is equal to 200. They are not equal. Number 1 equals number 2 is false. Number 1 not equal to number 2 is true. 300 is greater than 200. 100 is not less than 200 minus 100. 100 is not greater than or equal to 200. 100 is less than or equal to 200. Let's look at logical operators next. And logical operators give us the ability to combine expressions. In the comparison operators we just looked at, we used one expression. Is one number less than or equal to greater than or equal to another number? Logical operators give us the ability to combine expressions. So to do that, we're going to create four integers and a few strings. Here we're going to use two expressions. The first expression is number one less than number two, which is true. And the second expression is number three less than number four, which is also true. Because remember, number one is 100, number two is 200, number three is 1,000, number four is 2,000. So if both of these expressions are true, if this expression is true and this expression is true, then run the code inside the if block. And in this case, that code prints. Both are true. Next, we'll use an or to see if this expression is true, if author equals author 1, which is not true, or author equals author 2, which is true, then run the code in the if block. And we can see that one of the two expressions is true. Either Ken or Robert wrote the example. We can use the not operator to ask if an expression is not true. Number 1 is 100. Number 2 is 200. This expression returns false. So if not false, which is true, then run the code in the expression. So if it's not the case that number 1 is greater than number 2, then run the following code. The XOR operator gives us the opportunity to ask if only one of the expressions is true. If number 1 is greater than number 2, or number 3 is less than number 4, if only one of these is true, then run the code inside the if. Number 1 is not greater than number 2, but number 3 is less than number 4. So only one of the expressions is true, and that code runs. The AND also is the short circuiting version of the AND operator. So if author 1 is Andy, which is not true, and also author 2 equals Robert, then run the following code. Well, author 1 is not Andy, 
So if author one is not Andy, then it can't be the case that both of these expressions are true, and therefore this second expression will not even be evaluated. There's no point in checking if author two is Robert once we've determined that author one is not Andy. The or else is the short circuiting version of the or. If author one is Ken, which is true, or author two is Robert, then run the code in the if block. Once we've determined that author one is Ken, we know that one of these two expressions is true, and therefore author two equals Robert is not evaluated. And here are the results of the logical operators. We can determine if both expressions are true, that's the and. We can determine if one of the expressions is true, that's the or. We can use the not to determine if an expression is not true. We can use the XOR to determine if only one of two expressions is true. We looked at the AND also to see if two expressions were true. And since the first one wasn't, nothing got printed. So this last example is the OR ELSE, which determines if either of two expressions is true. And once it determined the first one was, it didn't bother looking at the second one. Let's look at using logical operators to work with objects. We'll declare two objects, object 1 which contains A, object 2 which contains a 7. If object 1 is object 2, meaning if object 1 and object 2 are referring to the same object, then we'll print that. Well, they don't. Object 1 refers to a string, being A, and object 2 refers to an integer, which is 7. If object 1 is not object 2, then we'll print that. Next, we'll set object 2 equal to object 1, and now object 1 is object 2, meaning they refer to the same object. And so object 1 is not object 2, we'll return false. Next, let's look at type operators. The type operator gives us the ability to query for the type of data that's being stored in an object. So we'll dim object 1 as an object, we'll store 7 in it, and then we can ask, does it contain an integer? If the type of object 1 is an integer, which is true, then print that. Now we'll store a decimal in the object, and type of object is decimal is true. Let's put a string in there, and type of object 1 is a string. Finally, let's put a single in there, and use the getType method of object 1 to display what type of information is stored in the object, and that's system.single. Our last example is operator precedence. Let's create three integers, first amount, second amount, third amount. And then look at this if statement. If the first amount is greater than 50 and the second amount is greater than 300 or the third amount is less than 500, then do something. Well, there's three expressions here. First amount greater than 50, second amount greater than 300, third amount less than 500. And there's an and and an or. So are we saying if the first amount is greater than 50 and either the second amount is greater than 300 or the third amount is less than 500? Or are we saying if the first amount is greater than 50 and also the second amount is greater than 300 or the third amount is less than 500? Well, it turns out that what we are saying is is the first amount greater than 50 and it's also true that one of these two expressions is true. Because the rules of operator precedence are that AND takes precedence over an OR. Well, we had to ask the question, what are we asking here? And we had to look at the code and determine it. So rather than have to remember the precedence rules or look them up, 
A best practice would be to use parentheses to make it clear what you're doing. And that's also the way that you can control the precedence. So in this second if, I use parentheses here to identify the first expression. So if the first amount is greater than 50 and the second amount is greater than 300, that's one expression, or the third amount is less than 500, then print something. So by using parentheses, I tell the runtime which expressions to group and what order to do the comparisons in. So let's run this and evaluate and see the results. So in the first example, and this is the default precedence, let me move this down so you can see. So in the first example, the runtime evaluated first amount greater than 50, and then evaluated the second expression, which was second amount greater than 300 or third amount less than 500. The first amount is greater than 50, and one of the following is true, second amount greater than 300 or third amount less than 500. Using the parentheses, we changed the order and grouped the first two expressions together and then evaluated the third. So both first amount is greater than 50 and the second amount is greater than 300, or the third amount was less than 500. So by using the parentheses, you can control how expressions are evaluated. So what you've seen in this demo is using various operators and controlling the precedence that the runtime will evaluate expressions in.